Thank you very much, uh, Eric. Merci bien. Uh, good evening, everyone. It's um, good to be here with you. I'm just going to um, share my screen so um, you can see the uh, presentation that I've got, at least I hope uh, that will be the case. So rediscovering lament. Well, I thought perhaps just the best place for us to start would be to answer the question, why do this now? Why in amongst all of the other topics that we could have chosen to consider, did we choose to look at lament? And specifically the way in which lament is used in the Bible. Well, I think that um, there are two contexts for this. The immediate reason is of course the COVID-19 pandemic and we're all aware of that and the impact it has had upon us all. The pandemic has caused us to reconsider, I think, quite a lot of things concerning our lives and our faith. Our last seminar looked at leadership within the context of this pandemic and indeed beyond. And the restrictions and the lockdowns we've experienced have, I think, forced us to consider many aspects of what it means to be Christians in God's world. Situations may be slightly different from one country to another, and I'm aware that we have people ranging at least from uh, the United States to uh, Pakistan and then down into Africa. So I'm not going to attempt to deal with everything that might have come up. But I hope that while my immediate context is the United Kingdom, that there will be lessons we can learn wherever we happen to live. Indeed, I recognize especially that some of what I say may not be quite as applicable in some other areas of Europe or indeed other parts of the world, areas which have a more recent history of suffering and difficulties that have come through political systems or war, for example. But if the immediate context is the COVID-19 pandemic, I think there's a broader context that we need to keep in mind as well. It's a context which COVID has highlighted or magnified perhaps, but one which is always there. And that is the question of how we deal with suffering in general. What is our theology of suffering? And in a sense, we're going to be exploring that a little bit this evening. The question of suffering is one which is usually, I think, raised within the context of apologetics. But I think it also sits centrally somewhere else. It sits within pastoral theology and within the pastoral care that all of us are involved with of fellow believers. And I suggest that the question of suffering is perhaps even more important within our pastoral theology than it is in our apologetics. All of us here this evening will have had to deal with difficult situations, perhaps through the pandemic, perhaps at other times. And we will have had to have helped and cared for others who are going through suffering. How we deal with suffering, I think, is important in how we express our faith. And I think one of the things which is true, at least of more Western countries, is that we have a very poor theology of suffering. We don't really know how to deal with suffering. And um, not wanting to offend anybody, I think that might be especially true of those of us who are part of the broader brethren tradition. And we will perhaps return to something around that um, towards the end of this uh, webinar. What I plan to do 
is tackle the issue, issue of lament by looking at two typical, though somewhat extreme cases. We'll consider two Christians, um, Peter and Esther. Uh, they are uh, not real, they're made up. So um, uh, it's, it's not someone that anybody here knows. They're ordinary Christians seeking to be faithful to God in their lives. And then I want to consider what biblical lament is and what the purpose of lament is. We'll then return to Peter and Esther and we'll try to apply something of what we have learnt to them. And then we'll move to our time of questions and answers and perhaps think about how we might apply some of what we've discussed. Finally, um, I will try uh, once those that discussion is over to draw a few general conclusions and see if um, I can make just one or two practical applications for us in our fellowships. So let's meet our first person, Peter. The portrayal of Peter and of Esther is quite deliberately and by necessity um, a little bit exaggerated. It is a caricature of the situation in order to help us to see things, uh, I hope, just a little bit more clearly. But what about Peter then? Peter has been struggling throughout the pandemic with various issues, not the least being the loss of a close family member. The culture within which he lives encourages him to deal with this in a particular way, and it is very much the culture that uh, I live in within the UK and I think is common in much of Europe. He's told that he should look after himself, that he should put himself and his emotional needs first. He has even started using some of the apps that are available on our phones to help him um, breathe properly. Some of you may have those. Um, I didn't realize uh, I had to learn to breathe, but there you go, to breathe properly. Other apps which actually are encouraging um, mindfulness. And even though Peter's a Christian, he's very much part of this culture. And his church perhaps has not done all that much to equip him to deal with the difficulties in any other way. And one of the major issues with this approach is that the answer to problems is simply to try to find that within us and to change us, to look inside for answers. And what tends to happen is that leads to self-absorption, thinking just of ourselves. It can lead to a spiral where we gradually become more and more uh, depressed and affected by the circumstances that we are in and ultimately it leads to failure. Our second person, Esther, like Peter, desires to be a faithful believer, a good Christian, if you like. And one of the things that her fellowship has often said is that um, she should rejoice, rejoice at all times. But she's in the middle of the pandemic and she is dealing with all sorts of difficulties. And the problem is that she doesn't really feel like rejoicing. The situation is tough. She tries, but it feels false. And so what she tries to do is to change herself. But that fails. 
And what it does, as she looks at her situation and her encouragement that she's received to rejoice and her failure to be able to do that, this leads to a sense of guilt. It leads to a sense that she can't be a proper or a good Christian if she's unable to rejoice. So these two people, Peter and Esther, sit at opposite ends of a spectrum. And I suggest that that spectrum actually has quite a lot to do with our eschatology. And I don't mean by this uh, our actual understanding of the return of Christ, when and how, and the things that we as Christians seem to enjoy arguing a lot about. But I mean our eschatology in terms of the clear idea of what the glorious future of God's people, of us as God's people, actually is. The new heavens and the new earth, that wonderful picture um, we're well aware of. And I think these two people, Peter and Esther, are living out specific misunderstandings of what that future is actually all about and how that future relates to the present. And so Peter, Peter is working in what I would describe as under-realized eschatology which means basically that he's living his life as though things for Christians are no different whatsoever than they are for others. We just have to get through this life in the same way as everybody else. And in the end, it will all be all right. But actually our faith doesn't make much difference to us right now. In other words, he's not living with any of the realities of what God is doing in our lives at the moment. Esther, on the other hand, is living out what might be called overrealized eschatology. This is something which perhaps we come across or at least are aware of more often. She expects all the benefits and all the blessings of glory to be hers right now. All she has to do is to rejoice and these will be hers. It's the same sort of idea that we sometimes hear about healing, that all Christians ought to be well now when we know that all healing will only be complete in the new heavens and the new earth. This is over-realized eschatology. And both of these people actually are set up to fail. But to see how we might help them and to help others and indeed perhaps even help ourselves in terms of um, where we are on that spectrum. We need to spend just a little time on what lament is biblically. And so what is the definition of lament? At its most basic, we could probably describe lament as crying out to God from the midst of suffering or despair. In biblical terms, it's often marked by questions such as, why? Why, Lord, are you doing this? How long? How long, Lord, will this happen? And it can refer to a sense of abandonment by God or of God's seeming distance from the biblical writer. Or it can simply come out of a sense of bewilderment, of confusion at the situation the writer finds themselves in. It might be described, and, and I find this helpful, as having its basis in a sense of cognitive dissonance. Now, obviously, if we don't know the words cognitive dissonance, that doesn't help anybody. 
but let's see if we can explain what cognitive dissonance is. Cognitive dissonance is where we, what we experience and what we believe seem to be in contradiction. So the cry of why do the wicked prosper? Or the cry from Psalm 22, which is echoed by Jesus on the cross. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Cognitive dissonance for Christians comes about when what we believe about God, about his character, his love, for instance, seems to be in contrast to what we are experiencing in our lives. And so we feel a certain confusion and indeed bewilderment. And Job's words at the beginning of chapter 23 express much of what is meant by lament. Job replies in, in this way. Even today, my complaint is bitter. His hand is heavy in spite of my groaning. If only I knew where to find him, if only I could go to his dwelling, I would state my case before him and fill my mouth with arguments. You notice there how Job senses a distance between him and God. I would find out what he would answer me and consider what he would say to me. Would he vigorously oppose me with great power? No, he wouldn't press charges against me. There the upright can establish their innocence before him. And there I would be delivered forever from my judge. So Job recognizes or senses a distance between himself and God. But that sense of his situation is then placed up against the reality of what he knows about God. That he is a, a, a righteous judge. And Job is crying, trying to come to terms with this dissonance that perhaps we all experience on occasions. But the place where we come across laments most often is in the Psalms. And while we might think of the Psalms as songs of praise, and many are, the most common form is what we call the Psalm of Lament. And Psalm 13 is an example of this type of psalm. It's there on the screen in front of you. And here you can see again some of the elements that uh, are there in Job's statement, but also which I've mentioned a little bit earlier. Notice how the first four lines begin with how long, how long, how long, how long. That is the context of biblical lament. The fact that we can, from within our suffering, cry out, but not just cry out. It is crying out to God. And so let's move on and consider what the purpose of lament may be because it's all very well recognizing that there are, um, that lament exists as a biblical genre, but we need to ask ourselves why it exists. Why has God included this in his written revelation of himself, in his written word? Well, I think there are several aspects to this, but I want to just bring us four this evening. Firstly, Lament is honest. It recognizes that sometimes life is difficult and there appears to be no answer. That recognition is, I think, actually an important starting point for any form of resolution. Lament can be honest because it reminds us that God is not taken by surprise with when we say, why is this happening, Lord? 
God is not offended by that question. God is not um, surprised by it. The incarnation shows us that God in the person of Jesus understands all of these things. And so lament allows us to be honest with God about those things which are difficult. And the lament of scripture, secondly, gives all of us, as God's people, a language to use to express the frustrations, the sorrows, the pain that we feel. Thirdly, lament is intensely liberating. It gives a freedom to be able to address God with our frustrations, with our anger, with our pain, with our sorrow, with our confusion. And we expect, of course, God in some way or another to reply. But there is a freedom in lament. And fourthly, it gives us a safe place for tears. Using the words of a psalm of lament ourselves, reading them aloud, can be a very important and helpful way and a place where we can, in fact, cry and cry safely. God has given us this place. And it is in this place, this safe place that God has given us. As we express our sorrow and as we do that, not just individually, but I think especially when we do it in community, that's when healing starts to take place. Lament comes to a large extent out of a sense of isolation. We express that feeling. And as we do that, it can be reflected back to us by the community, the community of God's people. And in God's word and God's people, we begin to find ourselves in that place where God can begin to act in our lives. One writer, while referring specifically to the book of Lamentations, makes a point which I think can be applied to lament as a whole. Lament can be a resource for the work of reclaiming our humanity, for breaking through our denial, personal and social, and for teaching us compassion. It urges us to do the difficult work of reclaiming our passion for life, for justice and for empathy. I think they, that's, a, that's a quote that we could spend a long time uh, considering just in and of itself. But I think that does sum up to a large extent the purpose of lament. Because we are recognizing the reality of our situation and the reality that we can cry safely to God, then we are beginning to reclaim our humanity. We can break through denial, the denial that is there for both Peter and Esther in one way or another. And it teaches us compassion and empathy. There are many biblical examples of this, from the Psalms to Lamentations, from Job to the conversation that Habakkuk has with God. And it, it really is worth looking at Habakkuk and that is my final, the last example that I gave there, looking at it in real detail to understand how lament works. We're not going to be able to do that today, but it's a book that's well worth returning to if you haven't already done so during this time. But the purpose of lament does not end here. If that were the case, we actually wouldn't be in a very different situation from Peter in our example. Lament goes on. 
The purpose of lament is not to leave us in our pity, but to help us place that, con that pity and that sorrow in a context. In nearly every occasion in scripture, Lamentations and Psalm 88 are perhaps the only two ex exceptions to this. In nearly every occasion, lament never leaves us in despair. It never leaves us in that situation without hope. Lament always offers us a way forward. And that way forward is always through the revelation of God himself. This is true of Job, it's true of the Psalms, and it's true in Habakkuk. But this way forward is not the simplistic, I'll rejoice because you've been commanded to, of Esther's experience. It is something much more powerful, I think. It's something which is much more uh, nuanced. And so perhaps to see how this works, we might need might help if we return to Peter and Esther themselves. Peter and Esther have both been encouraged to deal with their situation in certain ways and in ways which do not really help them. In terms of biblical lament, Peter remains in the how long phase, and he never moves away from this. His expression of grief and sorrow may be put out there and reflected back by the community, but it is a meaningless, a meaningless reflection because it leads nowhere. Esther is, on the other hand, encouraged to look to Jesus. She has moved towards the answer, which is God himself, but the reality of her situation has not been taken truly into account. It's not been taken seriously, and then the command to rejoice becomes a meaningless leap into the dark. What biblical lament does is it brings these two areas together into a whole, allowing for the recognition of the reality of the sorrow and the despair, but then pointing towards the answer, which is not a simple one. It is the answer of God himself. Habakkuk's experience, I think, is telling and important here. His complaints to God come out of the situation that he is in, combined with the knowledge that he already has of God. Habakkuk wants God to do something, and God seems to be doing nothing. This is cognitive dissonance. And God's answer is, at least partially, to reveal something of himself to Habakkuk. Part of that revelation is a promise of a time when justice will prevail because God is a God of justice. Yes, your situation seems tough and is tough, Habakkuk, but remember who I am and I am working things out. But notice Habakkuk's situation doesn't change. What changes is his perspective on that situation. His situation remains the same, but if you like, through faith, he's able to see things slightly differently. And so Habakkuk's final prayer provides us with how our experience of reality and our knowledge of God can be brought together into harmony rather than appearing contradictory. The promise God makes leads Habakkuk to say this in some of what I think are the most powerful and challenging words in scripture. I heard and my heart pounded. My lips quivered at the sound. Decay crept into my bones. 
and my legs trembled. Yet I will wait patiently for the day of calamity to come on the nation invading us. And then it's these words which I think are so powerful. Though the fig tree does not bud, and there are no grapes on the vines, though the olive crop fails and the fields produce no food, though there are no sheep in the sheepfold and no cattle in the stalls. So in other words, even though my situation around me may seem hopeless, he says this, yet I will rejoice in the Lord. I will be joyful in God, my saviour. The recognition of the reality of the situation, but also the recognition of the reality of who God is. Habakkuk's situation has not changed. The reality of the situation has not been minimized or downplayed. But the historical realities of Habakkuk's experience are placed within the context of the eschatological reality of the promises of God. In our terms, he lives within the now and the not yet, knowing what the future holds, but recognizing what the reality is. So Habakkuk is neither Peter nor Esther. He has come to understand the situation, expressing his lament, but coming to understand it from the perspective of the revelation of God. So what I'd like to do now is to um, hand over to Frederick, who is going to be leading our time of uh, comment and discussion. And uh, once that time is over, uh, I will come back, uh, I hope, and just offer uh, one or two simple, uh, basic, I think, suggestions for how we can apply what we have learned in our Christian lives and in our fellowships. So I'll hand over to Frederick. Thank you. Thank you very much, Simon. I asked the panelists to appear with microphone and video. Welcome those who are in the panel and we, we like to, to look at some questions. I invite uh, those who uh, listen to the, the presentation, the attendees to uh, write your questions in the question and answer slot that you find on the bottom of your screen. Um, I would first go to the first question here I see on the screen and it says, and I addressed it to Simon himself first, did Jesus teach lament or only the hope of the kingdom of God? Um, I think he uh, did both. If you think of the Sermon on the Mount, where he's talking about those who are blessed, uh, this is the poor, this is the meek, it's um, often those people who would be considered to be in a position of um, where lament would be possible or uh, necessary. But I think also Jesus teaches not just in his words, but he teaches in his actions. Um, and his actions are just as important uh, as his words. Uh, you'll remember at the beginning of Acts, Luke talks about um, how his first book, the Gospel of Luke, was about all the things that Jesus began to do and to teach not just to say. And if you look at Jesus and his life, especially, um, and this is the time of year when at least those of us in the West are thinking these things through as we come up to Easter, Jesus very much uses the language of lament and shows lament at work. So I think both in word and in deed, uh, Jesus does just do that. Yeah, thank you. And uh, the, the kingdom of God is very much marked by suffering. Yeah? With the, the Bible, is, our New Testament is full of uh, these uh, verses that speak about uh, going uh, into the kingdom uh, through much suffering. So uh, it's not an, an extraordinary way or a, a way separate from the, the path, but uh, 
It's a, a, a way that leads to the kingdom. It's often through suffering. Um, thank you. Let me uh, turn to uh, some other panelists. And um, we have seen that uh, the biblical lament allows us to express ourselves freely to God in times of despair, in times of sorrow. How has this understanding of biblical lament changed the way you approach to God? In what way uh, do you practice uh, this biblical lament in your own quiet time, in your own way of approaching to God? Uh, may I ask uh, Uli to say a word to this? Yeah, thank you. Um, thank you. Thank you very much to, to Simon for this very uh, good ideas on uh, comparing Esther and Peter and over and under uh, realized es eschatology. I found this really helpful. Thank you very much. And um, I, I see the necessity of uh, speaking out my, my inner conflicts maybe my bitterness, my disappointment very much. And it takes some time because um, I find myself not really willing to sp speak out these feelings. And uh, especially in my, my morning time in which I think about what, what is going on inside me. And sometimes it helped me a lot to write down uh, what I do feel and ask myself what is going on inside me. And also ask God, what, what is it, what am I to learn? Or to just tell God I'm I'm despaired or I'm confused. Uh, I don't know how to go on, and just to to write down a prayer and to have my my emotions in in front of me, seeing my emotions written down, and understand I'm I'm in correspondence with, with God. So this is a kind of great help for me doing uh, lament even in a written form, uh, and knowing God listens and He wants to listen because He's really really interested in me telling openly about my feelings. Thank you. Any um, thoughts on this same question uh, from Faris? Well, I want to thank you for asking me the, the question. And of course, I want to thank Simon for what he said to us. And uh, I think that all the examples were, were excellent. Thank you very much, Simon. And well, uh, I am in a way in the same position as Uli. I, I don't write down my emotions, but I cry to the Lord and I ask him several times during, during the day, not only in my morning quiet time, but all, also during the day. And I was thinking while listening to to Simon at some of my experiences. And I, I, I had the feeling that many times I did suffer in, in different ways, physically and emotionally. For example, after a few months of my marriage, my father who was a believer passed away. And I remember that and uh, I, was far, I was living far away from his place. And I remember that when I arrived at my birthplace and uh, he had already gone to be with the Lord, I, I just went into my office, my former office, and knelt down and I cried to the Lord, Lord, please give me peace. And he answered immediately. So uh, it's, it's, it's a very difficult question, the, the one you, you ask, or some of our dear brothers from Europe or maybe some other countries asked. But I think that the Lord listens to us and how precious it is to know that he listens and he answers uh, by his will. So I had this immediate peace. And the following day during the funeral, I was also able to share some of these thoughts to the hundreds of people who were present, many of them unbelievers.
Thank you. Um, yeah, it's good to to know that we don't have to use polished words when we enter into his presence to to make it more beautiful and more uh, uh, yeah as we normally pray with with uh, good chosen words. But if you look at lament, it's just crying out to God. And uh, perhaps Cheslav, can I ask you to say also a, a word to this uh, question? Yeah, your mic. Thank you so much. Yes, I'm here. Thank you. Thank you, Simon. Thank you for allowing me to share. Um, I, I am excited about what I have heard about the so-called cognitive dissonance. Cognitive dissonance. Uh, how often we experience that. And uh, I think it takes, uh, it, it starts from the uh, wrong understanding of uh, biblical theology. Um, I, I want to uh, point out to, uh, to the teaching on dominionism. Uh, dominionism basically says three things. Number one, Satan usurped man, man's dominion over the earth through the temptation of, of Adam and Eve, the first uh, problem. Uh, the, number two, the church is God's instrument to take dominion back from Satan. It means our task is to take dominion from Satan. And we try to do everything possible uh, to, 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 to overcome Satan. And then number three, the Lord Jesus cannot or will not return. This is to deal with eschatology, Simon spoke about. Um, uh, he will not return until the church has taken dominion by gaining control of the earth government and social institutions. Uh, and I, I think, uh, just to be short, I, I, I have to say, I, God gave me wonderful lessons in the countries I did not expect to have those uh, lessons. Uh, uh, the first uh, country was China. Another one was uh, former Soviet Union, uh, the countries of the, of, of the former Soviet Union, especially Russia. Uh, you know, um, I, I met a person who spent 20 years in prison. And I asked him a question, brother, uh, what do you think about this time? And he answered, uh, Cheslav, if I would only be able to go back to prison, I would go there because I understand that our theology of tears, it is something what we need. I had many tears in prison, but during those 20 years, I have started much more, many more churches than when I was freed. And now when I am free in, in, in Russia, uh, the same story in China, uh, when I met one of the leaders and he, he shared his own story. Uh, I, I think this dissonance, which is created by dominionist, dominionistic theology uh, can be a threat to us. And I think, um, um, especially Esther became a victim of this type of theology. Um, I, I believe in theology of tears. This is the reason why I, I appreciate the book of Lamentations. Lamentations, uh, you know, the prophet uh, Jeremiah, he is the prophet of tears. He, he, he identifies with the nation, he identifies with the children, with the, with the people, all the people. And this is our approach today in the time of pandemics. We, we cannot say there's no problem, but we can cry with them. Brothers, sisters, I have never had so many opportunities to cry during the pandemics on the phone with the people who lost their dear ones, who, who are suffering, who are in hospitals. And this is, I think, the practical outcome. And we do not need to live in the cognitive dissonance for the glory of God. Okay, thank you very much. There are uh, 
someone with experience who talks here. But, uh, thank you for sharing this. I have one question here. Um, when does lament become pathological and the need for professional help and input arises? So when does lament become pathological and the need arise for professional help and input? Um, Andre, could you say a word to this? Well, thank you for starting me so on, on such an easy question. Uh, sorry, yeah, sorry. <laughs> That's very kind. Thank you, Frederick. I'll remember that. Um, <clears throat> um, it is, I think it's very hard to uh, figure out what is pathological and what is not. Um, maybe a couple of words. Uh, I have prepared very well with a group of uh, friends uh, for the time uh, when COVID hit. And I thought I was cognitively, to keep using that word, prepared. And it was only a, a few months into this whole situation that I realized that my heart was not prepared and that I needed to go through a period of grieving. Um, like after a death of a person, uh, in, in certain ways, uh, our world has died, the world that we knew and have been so, so well uh, uh, acclimatized in. And so, um, I, I think that uh, the lament has to take place. There are many people, and uh, um, it was mentioned before, Simon mentioned that, and, and um, um, I think the part, part of the problem in our circles is also that we've, we, we kind of adopted uh, uh, very often this uh, mentality that um, uh, um, all is well and should be well. And if it is not well, then you probably don't pray enough or, or there's something wrong with you. Um, I, I do think that we need to offer that time to lament and um, lament together. And I think this is another really important issue for us especially since we're dealing with this epidemic, have been dealing with an epidemic of loneliness even before COVID hit. But, but now many of, the, uh, 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 of our, of our uh, churches uh, uh, closed um, uh, or online, uh, people are very often alone and, and the despair is only magnified. And so lamenting in community, I think, is something that is hugely important. And um, maybe last word on this. Um, I find it sometimes difficult to pick up a phone and call someone out of the blue. And I have started doing this, just thinking, well, maybe if I call someone and say, you know what, I'm lonely today. It doesn't happen very often, but it does happen. Um, and I just wanted to talk to you, not to help you, but actually to help me. And I found that uh, community, establishing community, lamenting, crying community is something that is part of the kingdom of God that has been given to us as a gift. And we, we must use that gift, steward that gift well. Thank you. Yeah, thank you very much. And the question was also whether uh, to add, when is the need there for uh, professional help? if there are really uh, serious problems. Um, perhaps Eric, could you uh, expand on that last part just briefly? Yes, uh, well, I think this is part of uh, counseling uh, expertise <laughs> and uh, also spiritual uh, understanding on the, the situation of the, of the person you are facing. Um, uh, I would say that uh, when you are talking with a person who is constantly uh, lamenting, uh, well, you you have to try to discern. I would say what is the the, the real grieving and and what is maybe coming from more uh, uh, generic or a perpetual way of of behaving, and. Um, I think that uh, you need a lot of uh, spiritual discernment to to see okay how you can advise such a, such a person. Um, you you need also I would say in that perspective the, the help of God and uh, 
to to really see if the person is playing a role or um, or if she if the person is really i would say willing to to express something with a perspective of uh, be more intimate with God and, and having a, a, a kind of answer like I think Simon Express, uh, I would say the, the two the two extreme of uh, the the spectrum. Uh, so yes, I, I I think that there is not a one answer specific to that question. I think it's you need a lot of uh, discernment uh, for for scoping such situation. Okay, thank you. Um, it linked to the once the, the subject we had before uh, was uh, how can how could we do better at doing lament as Christian communities? Uh, Peter, what can a Christian community do better on lament? One issue that comes up in this. Uh... Uh, subject of lament is the question of honesty. My teacher used to say that uh, rule number one when you are praying is don't lie to God. And that makes a lot of sense. When you want to approach God in prayer, you have to be honest before him. Now, when we come to this area of lament, it's actually liberating because we uh, can look at it not only as a task or as a duty or as a challenge, to be honest, but actually as a kind of freedom, we can be honest with God. We can open what is in our hearts because we see that the writers of biblical psalms and, and books did the same. God is not uh, offended by that. God is used to hearing that and we can be completely honest before him. Now, the question is whether we can be honest in such way in the fellowship of our churches. And that's really a challenge, challenge to, uh, to have uh, these uh, relationships of trust where we can be honest, can be transparent, uh, share our lives. Uh, it's really good to do it when the weather is good to share uh, our life, share what we experience good and bad things. And uh, when there is good level of trust in the, in the relationships, uh, then uh, we can uh, use it uh, as a source of our a source of help when we, when we need somebody to support us, when we are grieving, when we feel pain. And in our fellowship, in the church, it uh, happens on various levels. It can be in small groups of two or three people who are uh, well acquainted and used to sharing things on a deep level. It can happen in uh, uh, small groups when we have them, groups of people who share life together and then uh, can support one another. And uh, it's great when uh, sometimes things can be completely open uh, in the whole fellowship of the church. Of course, our local churches, our assemblies are of various sizes, but this, uh, this feeling, this, this fact that we are a family is very important. And when we can experience that on various level with individuals in small groups and with the whole uh, church, that's a great mm -hmm. help. Yeah, it's just but we really have to learn that to be to be open to be honest, and then uh, also we have to learn how to be wise and supportive to those who who are brave enough to open what they are going through and uh, provide the help and support they need. Yeah, there will be the actually healthy body life, and that we weep together with those who are suffering, and uh, those who rejoice with those who are uh, joyful. I have another question here. And what's the difference between an Old Testament believer praying a lament and a Christian who knows from Romans 8 that there is a meaning in every suffering which the believers of the Old Testament did not have? Simon, could you expand on that one? 
I think I would say that um, part of the, the answer to that would be that the reality of the situation does not change um, because we are living this side of the resurrection. And therefore we will be in situations where um, even though in our minds, we know the reality, why perhaps, or, or, or what's going to happen uh, finally, um, we are in a situation which is, is difficult. So we do know, you might say that Habakkuk knew that God was at work. His question was, Lord, why aren't you doing it now? I want to see the answer now. And so for us, we may recognize that God is at work in our lives and through the suffering, but that doesn't mean that the time of suffering is any the less painful uh, for us to actually go through. And uh, yeah, in, in connection with this one, I asked Faris, what, is, what if the revelation of God does not come after lamenting? Thinking of Habakkuk. Well, <laughs> Again, this is a very easy question to answer, like my dear friend Andrew said. It's, it's very difficult and it takes uh, sometimes a lot of time, a lot of patience. And, uh, but the Lord is good to us. And uh, if it doesn't come, I think that we should uh, be wise enough to ask for some help. Uh, maybe through the elders of the assembly or to some of our good friends, maybe some friends who are far away. Because uh, sometimes we don't have the patience to wait. And sometimes it takes a lot of time since the answer will, will come, will, will, will arrive. And I think that uh, the examples that uh, Simon uh, spoke about uh, about Job and Habakkuk are very inspiring about this, but also the, in the life of the Apostle Paul in, in his experience, we, we read, for example, my grace is sufficient to you, and, uh, but he, 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 didn't, he didn't receive a revelation, he didn't receive an answer, but he was uh, encouraged to go on and he passed many difficult times and we see him suffering uh, towards the end of his life when he writes to Timothy, his second, his second letter and he urges him to, to come to arrive because he needs comfort and, and so on. But still he was waiting, knowing that the Lord uh, maybe soon or later was going to, to answer. Thank you. And that is uh, what, what faith is, uh, hoping, uh, reaching out, uh, expecting God to act. And it's go up to God when he acts. I have here a question uh, from Italy and translated. It says, lamenting, pleading, rejoicing in the various trials. How can we help and advise these people who face these trials in their lives? So practically, how can we help those in the situation they are going through. Uh, Uli, can I give this one to you? Um, I, I, th I think that what, is already, what has already been um, mentioned several times, uh, lamenting in community is a, is a very great help, uh, which means allowing people to express grief without giving quick answers. Uh, I also saw the question what uh, there might be some harm in uh, doing uh, lamentations in, uh, in community, uh, to lament in community because uh, people are sometimes too quick to cite some Bible verses or to tell someone, yeah, you shouldn't grieve. Um, but to allow to grieve uh, and not to, um, to push back grieving by, by giving quick answers and um, um, you know, telling people uh, you, you should be comforted and you should be uh, 
happy in the Lord, <laughs> over realized eschatology, or you should uh, unrealized eschatology, no, over realized. You should um, be happy in the Lord or just trust and so on. Just expressing grief. I think this is, is uh, the, the best one can do, which means listening, uh, showing empathy, uh, showing understanding, um, and waiting with the answers. Uh, it's it's uh, always amazing, even though there's a lot of uh, critique as to the friends of Hiob, of Hiob, Hiob, uh, but they waited seven days before they started speaking. And even then it was too, too early. <laughs> but who of us would wait seven days uh, with someone uh, lamenting and uh, would not feel bought. now. I know I should give him some comfort or some verses who which will have them on. Um, so yeah, it's it's for me, it's a, a big example, of, a great example of um, myself. If I, if I see someone who grieves, if I uh, experience someone who grieves, not to uh, take a shortcut for myself because sometimes it's difficult to, to bear someone uh, in our midst who is grieving. Uh, who is lamenting and not taking a shortcut and to try to uh, quickly solve the feelings, but to allow these feelings. This would, would be the way, I think, to um, accompany people who are in grief. Thank you for, for this. Uh, another to uh, Andre. Uh, why not accept that we do not always understand suffering, but that we as Christians, we have the possibility to throw all our anxiety on him. Um, yeah, that, that is the way forward. Um, I don't think that we have answers that very often are better than the answers of the world. I know that's provocative, but I do think that what we have is a so much better hope and it is this hope that it is crucial for us to be able to share with those who are suffering, regardless whether they're believers or not. And this would lead them also, I think, especially those who are not believers, to consider claims of faith if they realize that um, we are very transparent about the fact that we don't know much more than we think we do. Uh, I have children who are millennials, and um, those of you who have uh, uh, um, uh, such people around you will know how quick they are to find out if there's something not quite adding up in, uh, um, in a conversation. Uh, they're very quick to point out if something is not authentic. Um, and I think it is hugely important for us to be able to say, that we are suffering and uh, we're not all well. Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, it has been said several times already, um, um, there's this uh, concept of suffering um, shared is something that uh, we need to be taking on um, as uh, fellow believers carrying each other's burdens. Um, uh, as this, as this uh, saying goes, um, um, suffering shared is suffering halved. Um, and I think there is, there is, a, there is a, a, a huge wisdom in it. Thank you very much. Um, yeah, the millennials, they... Uh, and in the, the later generations, uh, life has become uh, easy, uh, others than uh, those who have experienced war and uh, harder times. And then it's, uh, yeah, it's every kind of suffering is, is uh, like a signal that God doesn't love us, uh, which is not uh, true, uh, that God is uh, present in our lives and uh, he, he forms us through suffering. Um, I have an, uh, a last question before we move on to the uh, part that Simon would uh, like to share with us as a closure. Uh, and that is very often we forget that children, even small children are also exposed to lament. How can we practically help them? 
Um, Jezlov, can I ask you for? Uh, <laughs> I like expected this one. question. I expected this question. Thank you so much. Yeah, I, I think um, uh, sometimes we have um, uh, an idea that children have no problems. They are like little angels. They always smile, dance, they talk, uh, but children have many problems. They share. And, you know, in, in order to get to know the problems, we have to spend time with children. Very often, we who work among the children, we teach them. We show them the Bible, we teach the Bible verses, and we give the solutions. We answer the questions very often they never asked. But we have to spend time with them, to play with them, to talk with them, to enjoy them. And also, when they have a problem, they should be free to come. One, one day, uh, uh, during a camp in Poland, a girl came and she said, my cat died. Of course, I should say, oh, it's like only a cat. But for this uh, girl, it was a problem. And I have discovered that this girl has never had friends. And the cat was the best friend and the cat died. And can you imagine, I, I, I cried with her um, because of the, that ca uh, cat died. Uh, friends, I think we, we, as adults, we need to spend more time, more quality, quality, quality time with children to be able to get to know them better, to go inside, not only outside of what we see. And also, of course, we, we should listen to what Jeremiah said. And I would, would like to read it from Lamentations chapter 2, verse 19. Arise, cry out in the night, at the beginning of the night, watches. Pour out your heart like water before the presence of the Lord. Lift your hands to him for the lives of your children who faint for hunger at the head of every street, every bless, every blessing to those who love children. Thank you. Just uh, from my personal perspective, just a short comment on this one. Uh, we've spent time in Africa, and it struck me that uh, when there's uh, suffering, when there's grief, uh, the whole family is present, children included. Whereas our cultures in the West. We try to separate our children from yeah, and, yeah. And, and take them away from the, those things. And uh, it's part of life. So uh, they better get used to it in a certain sense, uh, of course, in a, uh, in a wise way. But uh, we must be uh, yeah, open to, uh, to discuss this. And uh, thank you for sharing that uh, the importance also to uh, grieve with the younger generations. May I give uh, time and the opportunity to uh, go to as part of the application. And I ask the other panelists to close down the, the mics and the videos. Uh, thank you, uh, Frederick, and thank you to um, all of the panelists and, and thank you especially to all of those who've asked um, uh, questions. There, there are a number which we just haven't had time to um, to to deal with, and uh, my apologies for that. I was particularly though struck with a question from Shabazz in Pakistan about the constant suffering of Christians in a country like that. And um, when we talk about suffering in the West and in the UK, we often do mean things like a pandemic. Whereas in Pakistan, we're talking something which is of a totally different nature. And um, it would perhaps be good to hear someone like Shabazz talk about how that works, um, how suffering works there and how you deal with that. Um, I would hesitate to, to give any uh, advice or suggestions for people in that sort of situation, but it reminds us that suffering, whether it is the pandemic or it's for our faith or whatever, it is something which is um, universal. 
all of us experience this in one way or another, which is why it is so important that we do have the language of lament to be able to deal with that. And I'd like to just think of one or two ways uh, that perhaps we might consider how we deal with um, lament and how we apply that within our fellowships. Firstly, I think we need to find a way to make space for lament in our worship and other meetings. Um, we come from a non-liturgical tradition. Liturgical traditions tend to bring lament into their worship uh, as part of the liturgy. We don't have that for all sorts of uh, historical um, reasons. But perhaps we do need to consider about how we might prayerfully bring a space lament for lament within our meetings. Someone mentioned, I, I forget who it was on the panel, um, uh, writing their um, writing a lament themselves. Um, I've been in situations where that has happened, where as a group of people, we, we have sat down and written a lament and then shared some of them. Um, the poetry may not always have been brilliant, but it was a very good way just to be able to put down on paper and share with people something uh, of what we were going through. Leaders will need to lead by example. Leaders will need to show how lament can be part of, and part of, I say, a healthy, fully rounded time of praise and worship. Lament, as I mentioned earlier, lament, the aim is not to leave people in the mess that they're in, the sorrow that they're in. That's Peter again. It is about helping us to move forward through that revelation of who Jesus is, through coming to an understanding of what God is doing in us and through us. And I'll come back to that in a moment because I think there's a lesson there which is very important for our pastoral theology. So our leaders need to lead by example. And the next thing we need to ensure is that we do teach good, clear biblical eschatology. And I don't mean by that a particular understanding of the return of Jesus. What I do mean is a biblical understanding of the relationship between the future glory that will be ours and the present situation, which is in very many ways a little bit messy. And part of what we are called to do and to be, I think, as God's people now, is to show within our communities, within our fellowships, as God's people, something of the reality that will be ours for the future, a foretaste of glory, if you like. And we are to show that despite our failings and despite our sin. God has chosen to leave us on earth from the point of our conversion. He could, of course, have chosen to do something else. And I think part of the reason for that is to allow us together to grow together in our understanding of what it means to be his people and to show something of the reality of the future in the reality of the present. And finally, I think it means having a clear and good pastoral theology. And I think perhaps the most important aspect of this is that pastoral care, caring for people within our fellowships, is more about the journey that people are on 
than the destination. We know the destination, that's glory. Are we helping people become more like Jesus in our pastoral care? Is that person we are caring for gradually, and it probably will be gradual, we've only got to look at ourselves to realize that, gradually making progress towards the likeness of Jesus. And if they are, then praise God. But let us not expect them to have arrived at the perfection of glory while still here on earth. That's once again, Esther, that's over-realized eschatology. And so as Christians, yes, we can say that we know the why of suffering, but sometimes it can take people a long time to the point before they recognize that. And we need to be patient with people. The example of Job and his friends was already mentioned, but even after his friends um, start speaking and Job answers, we have quite a long while until God finally reveals himself. Sometimes patience and perseverance are important in our Christian lives and in our care of, of others. I believe that lament is one of God's greatest gifts to us as his people. It's a language that he has graciously given us to help us live our lives in this world in a way which will reflect to some extent the realities of our future. And perhaps if, well, if nothing else comes out of this pandemic, at least in, uh, in the West, then rediscovering lament may be the most important thing that happens. Because rediscovering lament will perhaps allow us to be better disciples of Jesus and more effectively bring the good news of Jesus to the people around us who are in the same situation and yet are without God and therefore without hope in this world. So thank you all very much for uh, this evening and the privilege of being able to share just a few thoughts with you. I'll now hand back to, um, to Eric. <laughs>